Lord God, we come to you, and Lord, we praise you, God, that you gave everything for us. God, as we come together tonight on this Good Friday, Lord, we acknowledge the sacrifice that you took. God, the pain you went through, the anguish of the price that needed to be paid. We praise you for that. And God, we know that even though we call it Good Friday, it was not good for you. God, we call it good because it's good for us. And Lord, we thank you for that sacrifice. God, as we continue in worship tonight and surrendering our hearts to you, opening your word and reviewing the events of the last 12 hours of your life, God, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to just how much you truly love us. Because, God, you showed us. We thank you for that. May you continue to bless the service and, Lord, prepare our hearts to receive the word tonight. So we are going to look tonight um, at God's Word and at, at the, the last 12 hours of Jesus' life. And, and through, through these last several weeks leading up to this holy week, we have been looking at the, um, the person of Peter, right? The, the disciple um, that was a part of Jesus' inner three, and, and he learned lots of extra lessons, right, from Jesus with Peter, James, and John, and, and yet we've also looked at his personality and realizing that he's in a lot of the stories because he's the one that always jumps out in front and just says what he's thinking and, and acts first and then thinks about it later. And, and on, on Sunday, as we've gone through, we've been building up to this weekend, right, as we've been looking at Peter, on Sunday we ended with this verse in Luke 22, 31, and 32. Where, again, the words of Jesus, and he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat. But I have pleaded and prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. And again, we, we talked about this briefly on Sunday, but just about how, how Jesus knows what's coming, right? Not only just for him, but he also knows what's coming for the disciples and, and even specifically for Peter. And we've seen, we started again several weeks ago in Matthew 16, where Jesus anoints Peter and he tells him, on this rock, I will build my church. And now here, though, Jesus again very blatantly tells Simon Peter that, hey, there's a lot, a little more processing you got to go through, right, before your character's ready to be that rock. Right? And Jesus tells him, he's like, you're going to be sifted, right? Like wheat, meaning you're going to be crushed. You're going to be separated. You're going to be, you know, molded and transformed to be more useful. So like I said, tonight we're going to step back into the scriptures. We're going to look and walk through the events of the story between the Last Supper when Jesus tells Peter this, right? And Jesus' death on the cross. And on the timeline, that's about 12 hours right, between them leaving the Last Supper, right, and when Christ is hanging on the cross. So tonight we're going to uh, jump into the story. Once again, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26. So if you have your Bibles with you, you're welcome to open with me. If not, there are Bibles provided for you in the seats you're welcome to use. If you're with us online, uh, hopefully you have your Bible close to you, but we're going to start with Matthew 26, 36 uh, through 46. So we have Matthew chapter 26, uh, we're going to pick up at verse 36. And this is, just to set the context, this is after they have left uh, the Last Supper, right? Judas kind of scatters, they're, they're, some of the disciples scatter, and then Jesus ends up in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, right, with kind of his... Once again, inner, inner three disciples. So Matthew 26, picking up at verse 36, says, Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go over there to pray. And he took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he, be, and he became anguished and distressed. And he told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. 
Stay here and keep watch with me. And he went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, My father, if this, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. And he said to Peter, Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. And then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. And when he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. And so he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. And then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. Again, this is in the garden. We see he's praying. And again, at this point, Jesus is, it, is wrestling with what he knows is coming. Right? He's wrestling with the, the price that must be paid. Again, he's saying, like, man, can, can it be accomplished any other way, Father? Right? And, and he's saying, is there anyone that take it from me, right? Like, and this is beginning to, be part, to see part of the human side of Jesus in this moment. Right? Of, of knowing what's ahead. Because the divine part of Jesus knows what's about to happen. Right? We see in this, you know, this kind of back and forth between Jesus and the disciples right now. I mean, this is in the middle of the night. I mean, we can't blame them for being tired. Right? And we've all been in there in that moment, right? When we just, you, you're trying to stay awake, but you just keep nodding off. Right? When it's, it's, it's the late night, midnight showing of the movie you've been waiting for it to come out, right? And you go to it and you're like... Right? And so you're just fighting to stay awake. And, and again, just Jesus tells him, he's like, man, the spirit is willing. I, I, I see your heart. I know you want to be here with me, but, but the flesh is weak, right? The body's weak. Like, you're, you just, you need sleep. And, and notice so what specifically what he says specifically to Peter in verse 41. He says, keep watch and pray so you will not give in to temptation for the spirit is willing but your body is weak. And, and yet again, this is again a, a calling out of Peter. I mean, one that, that, that he, again, he, he goes to Peter and we've seen he's reprimanded him many times. And, and yet at, at the reality is this is a foreshadowing of what's about to go down throughout the night. Right? I mean, he, he's already predicted to Peter that, hey, you're going to deny me, right? There's, you're going to be sifted. There's going to be all these things happening. And again, Peter's like, no, 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 right? And at this point, Jesus is like, man, but you got some weak parts, buddy. Right? And Jesus knows that, right? And he's, he, he's kind of laying that out and even foreshadowing it for Peter. And, and, and notice that there's no rebuttal of Peter, which is a little out of character. And yet we learn and we can identify with him, like we've all been in that moment, but, but yet this bigger spiritual concept, right, that we see even in this moment as he reprimands Peter, is we, we understand that even with the best of intentions, we still fall short. Right? Even with the best of intentions, we still fall short. I mean, we, the flesh is still weak. Right? Even when our spirit is willing, even when our heart is, is engaged, right? like, like we, we still can fall short, and which is exactly why we need a Messiah. And as we can, again, identify with Peter, identify with this, this we all have fallen short. I mean, in fact, exactly what Scripture tells us, right? We all fall short of God's glory. And as we, we see this, now we're going to continue on in the story, pick right back up with verse 47. So hopefully you left your Bible open. We're going to go right back to it, okay? To 47, picking up at verse 47. And he says, And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men, armed with swords and clubs. And they had been sent by the leading priests and the elders um, of the people the traitor Judas had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. And so Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed and gave him a kiss. And Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. And then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. 
Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us and he would send them instantly? But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? And then Jesus said to the crowd, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there teaching every day, but this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in the scriptures. And at that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. We see here, right, this kind of the the next step, right, of the plan of redemption, and that is Jesus being arrested. That they show up with the swords, right, and, and again, we see here that Peter lives up to his reputation, right? Because now again, in in Matthew's version, right, he just says one of the disciples, right? I mean, Matthew's kind of nicer to to Simon Peter than than some of the other writers. I tell you, John, in his account of this happening, he calls Peter out. Okay, John 18, 10, 11. He says, then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back in its sheath. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering my father has given me? Again, John names Peter, right, as he's the one that jumps in with the sword, right? And and, and again, we know his heart, right? His heart is to protect Jesus. His his heart is to be all in, right? And and there, and yet, we we also kind of realize, right, that, that he, once again, kind of for the last time in this moment, gets reprimanded by Jesus. Right, because he, Jesus tells him, he's like, Peter, you, you, don't, you don't get it, right? You don't get the bigger picture. Like, I have to do this, and you're not going to stand in my way. Again, in the midst of this, kind of thinking about is, I, again, we don't know about Peter. We know he's a fisherman. We, know, we don't, don't know how accurate he was with his sword. But my guess is he was not aiming for the guy's ear. Right, I'm sure he was, went into full-on protection mode, right, of Jesus in this moment. And he missed Right, and hit his ear. Notice, again, Jesus cleans up Peter's mess again, doesn't he? Right, because even with the best of intentions, we fall short. And when we fall short, Jesus cleans up our mess. Right, and that's exactly what he does here. Right? He heals the guy's ear and he reprimands Peter. Again, Jesus is literally telling him, hey, do not take matters into your own hands. Right? Because if you do, you're going to mess it all up. Okay, just, just trust me. Trust me and let things play out. And even when it feels chaotic, Jesus is re- reassuring Peter in this moment, I am in control. Don't get in the way. Just trust me. Right? And, and as he does this, though, we also realize right, that, that Peter's attempt to prove his allegiance actually starts his sifting. Right? This is the first moment, again, where we see Peter kind of start this downward run, right? And this is where, again, Jesus says, hey, just let it happen, buddy. It needs to happen. And we already know, right, from Jesus' prayer, like, he doesn't want it to happen. I mean, this is, right, he's like, is there any way I'll do it? But he's like, but this has got to go, right? And, and we see, again, Peter's attempt. I mean, again, his heart is in the right place. Right? But yet, he's trying to control what Jesus is already in control of. If we look at, again, Matthew 26, I want to jump down to verse 69. Okay, this is, so again, we're skipping over the part where Jesus goes in front of the council, okay, and he gets, you know, through his little trial, and then we end up here picking up at verse 69. Again, this is in the, the high priest's courtyard, right, as Jesus is being questioned and tried. And he, verse, picking up verse 69, he says, Meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came over and said to him, You were one of those with Jesus, the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And later out by the gate, another servant girl noticed him and said to those standing around, this man was with Jesus the Nazarene. And again, Peter denied it, this time with an oath. I don't even know the man, he said. 
A little later, some of the other bystanders came over to Peter and said, you must be one of them. We can tell by your Galilean accent. And Peter swore, a curse on me if I'm lying. I don't know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. Now we see again in these moments, and we've seen Peter in all kinds of moments, right? And, and yet we can all identify with him at different times. Okay, in this moment, as we see all of it kind of culminate, right, into you where the words of Jesus come true, right? And, and we see in, in the last verse we read, verse 75, it says, suddenly Jesus' words flash through his mind, before the rooster crows, he died me three times. And he went away weeping bitterly. Again, this is that moment, right, when the truth comes rushing down upon us. Right? When we realize how short we fall, when we realize we've messed up and we've messed up royally. Right? This is when the weight of our sinful choices and decisions crashes. Hey, this, is, this is a moment, right, of Peter's anguish. Hey, and the reality, though, in this moment is, is he's weeping bitterly. It's not just about the fact that he denied Jesus these three times that these words came through. Hey, Peter's anguish went way beyond this moment. Hey, because this moment is when he realized his own depravity. Now, depravity is, this is a big word, okay? This is, this is a big theological fancy word. So let me tell you what depravity means. It, 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 depravity is a big theological term that means we all fall short and can't save ourselves. Right? It's when we realize we need a savior. We realize we fall short. It's when, again, the, the truth is laid bare in front of us our own depravity. I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Hey, it's when this big picture becomes incredibly personal. Is when we realize our own depravity. And this is what happens to Peter in this moment. Hey, and and this is that moment, right, when he, he feels the, the, not just the weight of his own sin. But I'll venture to say this is also when he starts to comprehend why Jesus is doing what he's doing. When it all starts to make sense. And, and in this moment, right, is, is when he, Peter starts now this journey of, of choices. Because we're all in this choice, in this moment, right? We all, we all end up in this moment. Sometime when our, just our spiritual lives, our, our emotional lives are just crushed. And in this moment is where we have, we have a choice to make, right? Of Now, where am I going to go from here? Right, what's my next step? And when we realize this, we see again that Peter makes a choice, and we also realize that Judas ends up at this very same place. Okay, if we pick up the story in Matthew 27, I want to look at verses 1 through 10. It says, Very early in the morning, the leading priests and the elders of the people met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. And then they bound him and led him away and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. And when Judas, who had betrayed him, realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. And so he took the 30 pieces of silver back to the leading priests and the elders. I have sinned, he declared, for I have betrayed an innocent man. But what do we care, they retorted. That's your problem. And then Judas threw the silver coins down in the temple and went out and hanged himself. The leading priests picked up the coins. It wouldn't be right to put this money in the temple treasury, they said, since it was payment for murder. 
After some discussion, they finally decided to buy the potter's field, and they made it into a cemetery for foreigners. And that's why the field is still called the field of blood. And this fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah that says they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price at which he was valued by the people of Israel, and purchased the potter's field as the Lord directed. Now we see here, not only Peter does he realize his own depravity, but so does Judas. And so does Judas. And, and, and in this moment, right, we, we see, again, this, this same moment. I mean, Judas ends up, right, in, at the same place that Peter's at in 27.3. He says, when Judas, who betrayed him, realized Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. And suddenly, him and Peter are right next to each other, right, in the state of their mind and their soul. But yet, Peter and Judas find themselves in the same place, but guess what? They made different choices, though. Right? They made different choices. In fact, when you look at the life of Judas, and you might, if you ask the question, what was Judas's biggest mistake? I think the first thing that we'd all say, well, Judas' biggest mistake was taking the silver in the first place, right? Was betraying Jesus. I disagree. Judas' biggest mistake was not betraying Jesus or taking the money. Judas' biggest mistake is he didn't make it to Sunday. See, Peter did. Peter made it to Sunday. Because Peter did what Jesus told him to do, right? In his last reprimand in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told Peter, trust me. Don't give up. Make it through. Because I've got a plan. I'm in control. Right? And, and Peter did that, even in the moment, even in that moment when his soul is crushed and he's, he, he realizes his own depravity, right? And the, the choice he makes, though, is I will trust Jesus. Judas didn't make the same choice, did he? Judas took matters in his own hands, right? Judas dealt with his own depravity in the most horrific way. Right, now, again, if Judas had made it to Sunday, right, would Jesus' blood have covered his sin too? Absolutely. Judas' biggest mistake was he didn't make it to Sunday. Peter did. Hey, and as, as we, we realize, you know, this, and, and again, the, the weight of that, right, is, is we are faced with that same choice, right? Are we going to trust Jesus? When we feel crushed, when we feel sifted, when we feel that we're complete failures, that when we realize I fall short of the glory of God and I need a Savior, will we trust what Jesus says? And will we follow Peter's example? Hey, Luke, I want to flip over to, to, to Luke 23. We're going to look at Luke, look at Luke 23, verses 26. And 32 to 43. So Luke 23, verse 26, tells us, As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside. And the soldiers seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. And skipping down to verse 32. It says, Then two brothers, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. And when they came to the place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And his soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. And the crowd watched, and the, as the the leader scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen one. And his soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. And they called out to him, If you are king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, 
this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, so you're the Messiah, are you? Well, prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you've been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. And again, as we read even this text, we see as Jesus is hanging between these two criminals, and this conversation happens there, right? We see both of these men, I mean, also realize their own depravity, right? They're dying for their crimes. And notice they make opposite choices too, don't they? And we see as, as Jesus, again, talks to them, right? Not just to them, but just we still see the heart of God, even as he has been beaten, even as he has been sentenced to death for, for no reason. Right? Even the thief knows that. Right, as, as he's hanging there through this, what is, again, the, the heart condition of God in this moment? All right, verse 34, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And the, the heart of God is for forgiveness, even when he's taking our punishment. While on the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Did you think Judas was included in that prayer? I do know that the grace made possible by Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection that we're going to celebrate on Sunday would have covered Judas just like it covers you and me. Just like it covered that thief. Just like it covers Peter. And again, I think as we realize and look at all these different people and their perspectives and interactions with Jesus, even while he was taking our punishment, while he was being beaten and crucified and giving up his life as a ransom for ours, again, God was, the heart of God was, it's all worth it because they can be forgiven if I do this. Again, they all needed God's grace. I think we have to ask ourselves the same question, right? Do we need God's grace? Spoiler alert, the answer is yes. We do. But the reality is, no matter how much you have messed up, Jesus still loves you. No matter how much you've messed up. Right, whether you've messed up on a Peter level Right, or a Judas level, or a thief on the cross level, Jesus still loves you. He does. But yet we have a choice. Right, will we choose Jesus? Will we trust him and embrace his plan? Or will we take matters into our own hands? You know, I'm good. I'll just save myself. I don't need you. Right? And we're all faced with that choice. We see that same choice, right, going back and forth, and we see that same choice every day in our world. Right? We still have to choose Jesus. And yet, again, it was his, his crucifixion, his death on the cross that, that stepped in our place, right, to, to pay the price. In Luke 23, verses 44 through 47, we see the conclusion of this part of the story. It says, By this time it was about noon, and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone, and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. And then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. And when the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshiped God and said, surely this man was innocent. Even the Roman officer saw the truth. The weight of what was happening, of 
of this like, dark in the middle of the day, and just, just, you know, all these things are happening around the death of Jesus. I, I mean, think about this moment, right? Verses 45 and 46, right? The light of the sun was gone. And suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. And Jesus shouts, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with these words, he breathes his last. And again, the timing of this, we talked about it last Sunday, right? The timing of this was not coincidental, right? This was at the Passover. I mean, the Passover was foreshadowing what Christ was going to do on the cross. Right? That it's by the blood of the Lamb that God saves his people. Okay, and we, we know, right, and we, we see, right, the, the power of this is, is, that, is that Jesus' death on the cross and his coming resurrection is what makes our salvation possible. Okay, and when you think about, again, the answer, right, I... I that I, or the answer to the question I asked earlier, right? Do we need grace? It's absolutely yes, we do. We absolutely need grace. Right? And, and we receive grace by receiving Christ as our Savior. Right? By believing in our heart that he was God, right? That he was our sacrificial lamb, that he stepped in our place, that he died and he rose again so I could be saved. It's believing that, it's it's. Confessing that with my mouth, right? And ask, say, Jesus, I need your grace. I, I thank you for paying the price for me and, and coming into my life. And again, if, if you've received Christ as your Savior, right, then we're going to commemorate what Christ did with communion tonight. Okay? And, and so again, as, as we think about why we're doing communion okay, tonight is just because communion is the physical reminder of Christ as our sacrificial lamb. Okay, and it's, it's the taste of the bread and the juice, right, that just, it, it engages our senses in a way that, that helps our mind to comprehend. And so at, at this time, before we do that, I'm going to break the bread. And again, we, we break the bread because Jesus' body was broken for us. And I'm going to pray for the bread and for the juice. So let's pray together. Lord God, we come to you, and God, we thank you for this bread that represents your body. And God, we thank you for this juice that represents your blood that was shed on the cross. And God, we know that your heart and your motivation for going through the suffering and the beating and death and resurrection on Sunday was to pay for our, our sin, not yours. God, I pray your blessing on the bread and blessing on the juice as we partake of it tonight. God, that it truly motivates us God, to love you back with everything we have. To never forget the sacrifice that you made. Thank you for being our sacrificial lamb. For stepping in our place. Purchasing our salvation. God, we choose you. We trust you. And we thank you for it tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as we just prepare our hearts and minds for communion tonight, just reflect on our sacrificial lamb.